Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and answering your questions tonight, marketing strategist and self-declared propagandist Toby Ruff, feminist, historian and intellectual Jermaine Greer, blues singer Christy Hughes, American pastor Craig Gross who travels the world saving sinners from pornography and young Queensland writer Benjamin Law. Please welcome our panel. All right, Q&A is live from 9.35 Eastern Daylight Saving Time. It's simulcast on News24 and News Radio. Go to our website to send a question or join the Twitter conversation using the hashtag that's just appeared on your screen. Well, our first question comes from Leo Corbyn. Uh, why is the political debate in Australia so shallow? Is it because our politicians think we're stupid or, or because we are stupid? Jermaine Greer. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd do that. Uh, actually, I think it's because the media are so stupid. They create non-issues, like the one about Labour leadership, which they drummed up for weeks until they finally made it happen. Well, and then guess what? it didn't turn out to be a non-issue, did it? Well, yes, it did. <laughs> Kevin Rudd disappeared without trace. What did you think <laughs> was going to happen? Oh, he's a, it's a real challenge against the leadership. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happened there. Um, and now one of the big issues is, you know, who's going to head the future fund? And most people think the future fund has got something to do with pie in the sky and wealth and wonderfulness and paradise. It's actually accountancy. It's about what you do with public servant, but people in the public sector's pension fund and where you put it. Well, that's what <laughs> AMP does and Suncorp and a whole lot of other people who are probably shonkier, even. <laughs> um, I think that's the problem. The, the media are so used to talking down to people uh, because they think that's the way they're going to sell more copies. And I must say, speaking as someone coming f who lives eight months of the year on the other side of the world, I can't believe that Australian newspapers are still selling copies. I mean, haven't we figured out there's no news in them, for one thing? There's a lot of misinformation, a lot of bad writing, a lot of bad grammar. Uh, <laughs> why don't we just can them, just get rid? Yes, OK. Well, Toby, we'll, we'll go to you when, and we'll go back to the question, actually. When it comes yeah. to political and policy debate, are we stupid? Do the politicians think we're stupid? Uh, look, I don't think they... I don't think we're any more stupid than they are. Um, I, I think we're sort of equally, equally puerile and equally guilty. Uh, to Jermaine's point, I, I think the media are at, at part at fault because we've got uh, too many media, too, too many newspapers and not enough news. We're a very small country. You're, you're in the business of influencing people's thoughts and behaviour. Is public relations and polling part of the problem here? Uh, I like to think so, yes. <laughs> So you admit to being part of the problem proudly, is that right? Uh, when I can be, yes. <laughs> Jermaine, do you want to get in on that, do you? Well, um, we, we live by the media. We are, I'm a journalist. I have to, I have to work with the media. Um, it's probably a good thing that the Australian media almost never asked me to do anything. Uh, what <laughs> yeah, they, right. <laughs> what they, I don't... Um, I mean... The, the hardest thing is getting you off television. No, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm speaking about the print media. Yes, sorry. And the print media pinch my stuff, but they never pay for it and they always get it out of context and they always make it crazy. They're looking for stuff that can create a little mini furor and that's just irritating. They're in the game of more heat than light. Okay. Or, and it doesn't matter what the issue is, but especially climate change. Boy, if it was possible to bugger up an issue, the Australian <laughs> print media have made it as inspissated the gloom so that nobody knows what's going on. Everybody's confused. And that's really not the job of, of national media. Let's go to Christy Hughes and the original question. Why is the political debate in Australia so shallow? Is it because our politicians think we're stupid or because we are stupid? Oh, look, what I want to say is I cannot stand how our Prime Minister speaks to us. People are so excited. Isn't it exciting we've got a female Prime Minister? And it really shattered me. She reminded me of that relief teacher that would come to school when you're in primary <laughs> school and talk to you like an idiot. <laughs> and now that we're spoken to like idiots, you behave like idiots. So, I don't know, who's the idiot? That's our leader. <laughs> 
Let's go to uh, Craig Grace. Feel free to answer this from an American perspective. You can you can give your perspective of American politics, whether the same thing might be true there. I think you guys sound smart compared to, uh, to us over <laughs> in the States and, and our politicians. I mean, the, the biggest debate right now uh, in the States is over this teleprompters. And I mean, we've got a very eloquent uh, president um, but, I mean, who's to say he writes any of that stuff? And he can use a teleprompter better than anybody. But um, what, would he, what would he communicate when he doesn't have that? And so I think, you know, when, when I'm watching that or listening to that, I'm just going, none of it's believable. Um, not just with him, but the other side as well. And so, I don't know. I mean, I, I was reading some of your media and, and some of the things that are going on here. I think it uh, sounds a lot smarter than uh, what we have over, over in the States. That's slightly encouraging. Ben Law. <laughs> Look, let's face it, you know, some things are really difficult to understand and we actually have to take the time to read about them, to analyse what's going on. And that takes time and maybe we have less of it. So when someone comes to us with a slogan like stop the boats and presenting himself as some sort of wizard who can some, somehow affect um, migration patterns or, or, or international conflicts that actually happen overseas as if he's got some sort of control over that, that's really difficult to digest the fact that we have very little control over some aspects of what's going on in that situation. So when we're presented with stop the boats, that's very, very appealing. All right, we've got another question on politics. It comes from Julian Evans. Uh, my question is uh, to Toby Ralph and, and the rest of the panel. Um, our Prime Minister, uh, Julia Gillard, seems to have a, a really major uh, image problem. Um, she just doesn't seem to be able to connect with voters um, as you know, evidenced every fortnight by her persistently appalling polling figures. I'm interested to know um, uh, from Toby uh, particularly, if you were on her staff, um, what advice would you give the PM? Um, Experiment with truth. I think she's sort of run out of <laughs> <laughs> run out of other options at this stage. She's in trouble. She's never quite found herself. Um, she's always been trying to um, fend off uh, the independents, hang on to the balance of power, keep her saboteurs on her own party on side, fight Tony Abbott, who's defining her, try and keep Andrew Wilkie happy. It's a tough, tough job. Uh, and she's never really seemed to be herself since she took that job. I think things are desperate sh and she'll have to experiment with truth. Let me ask you this. You've famously said, I'm a taxi, flag me down and I'll take you wherever you want to go. Uh, that seems to be your sort of motto. Let's say Julia Gillard flagged you down. Would you, would you pick her up? Absolutely. So you'd take that on? Absolutely. Yeah. In spite of the fact that you disagree with everything she thinks? I don't disagree with everything she thinks. I don't even know everything she thinks. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yes, I'd take that gig on. Absolutely, Tony. And what would you actually do? In the first day in the office, what would you say to her? I Apart from experiment with the truth, which she would regard as a political slogan. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd, I guess I'd want a conversation about what she really thinks and believes. And I'd like to know what's genuinely there, because I don't. I don't know it as an individual at the moment. Jermaine. Look, it's important to realise that Julia Gillard is part of a coalition. What that means is that she has to negotiate every single policy position. What that means is camel trading on the floor. It happens to be what she's good at. You can say, we want to know what she really, really believes. In fact, it's irrelevant because whatever she really, really believes is not what's going to happen. Now, I agree with you that she was very badly directed by Arbib and Albanese. They were really worried about her dry, matter-of-fact, unglamorous style that she showed us in when Rudd was away at the Bali conference, which was a complete bust, and she was there five o'clock in the morning on the breakfast television, the, the voice of common sense. And we thought, we really like her. I mean, she's not in love with the sound of her own voice, which clearly Rudd was. She never said 20 words when five words would do. There are lots of good things about her. She's an administrator. She gets things done. She understands that she has to constantly get people on side, give people jobs to do, make sure that they do them. It's unglamorous. It's not star material, uh, but it's what she's been doing. Uh, what I want her to do is get rid of those bloody jackets. <laughs> <laughs> they 
Jane Jane. So what, you come to him for political advice and you for fashion advice? No, it's not even fashion. They don't fit. Every time she turns around, you've got that strange horizontal crease, which means they're cut too narrow in the hips. You've got a big ass, Julia. Just get on. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> ben Law, I'm going to go to you on this subject. Uh, look, I've been doing um, some state election coverage, so I got, Julia, I got to see Julia Gillard speak for the first time in public. And it, it, you're right. I mean, she sort of talks like an automaton who's fed a press release in the back of her head. I just described her as having the speaking style of an animatronic bunyip. Um, <laughs> there, is, there is a problem here because she is, like you say, a really good negotiator. She's been thrown into a minority government. She has to negotiate with independents and Greens constantly every week. They sit in on a meeting and they trade and they negotiate. There is a communication that has to happen that Kevin Rudd, um, one, didn't have to deal with and two, he wouldn't be able to deal with because he's not that type of person. What we see as the public is her giving speeches, unfortunately. That's, that's the channel through which we um, digest Julia Gillard and it's not... Her strength, unfortunately, that's her weakness. Uh, Craig, I'm, I'm going to come with you to you, and I know it's unfair to do it, but I'm just going to ask you this one thing. Could you ever imagine a panel, um, a national broadcaster in the United States, in which part of the discussion was about the size of his bum? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you, you probably could. I'm just wondering, how does this lady uh, get elected? I mean, it sounds like she can't communicate. She's got an image problem, and, uh, I mean, what... How did she win? Did I, did I miss that? Oh, you sure did. That's a complicated story. This is, uh, this is Q&A. It's live and interactive. Our next question tonight comes from Michelle Chung. Hi there. Um, like Benjamin, my formative, my formative years coincided with the rise of Pauline Hanson. Being hated by complete strangers based purely on my appearance was extremely upsetting for my young soul. Although I haven't experienced anything like that since then, I still think that our national psyche, psyche stubbornly refuses to accept the pivotal role that immigration has played in the story of modern Australia. Do you agree? And if so, why do you think this is happening? Let's go to uh, Ben first on this. Um, so the story of how I came to be here is that my parents came over in, um, in the 70s. They came over from China, Malaysia, Hong Kong, all over Asia, and, and settled in Australia, in a part of Australia that they considered a ghost town. Not just because there were very few people there, but because everyone was white. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> they actually didn't have too bad a time of it. Uh, people were very willing to take them on at face value. Uh, throughout the 80s, I got the benefit of um, this whole campaign to embrace multiculturalism. You know, the first day I started Year One was in 1988. Uh, I was in Queensland, they had World Expo. There was this huge attitude that we should embrace different cultures. And you're right, things changed when it came into the 90s uh, and Pauline Hanson came into the scene. And I think there's always been cycles of fear that come through. They go up and they go down. There's always someone else to fear. Um, you know, it's Asians then, it's sort of Asians now, it's Muslims now, predominantly. Um, we seem to actually forget that one of the things that is very Australian, like uh, this idea of national identity is, is really, really tricky because what does Australian, what does being Australian actually mean? And I think the success of, uh, of our national identity is that it's completely mixed. We're not a monoculture and that's actually rare in the world when you travel. Krista Hughes. I must say I do find Australia ultimately a racist country. Uh, the fact that white settlers came here and killed uh, so many Aborigines, and we still have such a, and we still have such an issue, or more to the point, we ignore the issues of what's going on within Aborigine communities throughout the country. Uh, the white Australia policy, uh, we, we're terrified of boat people. I, I think we are ultimately very scared and ultimately, and I'm not saying everyone is racist, but a racist country. Let's go to Toby. Uh, yep, I think Australia is still in recovery from the white Australia policy. We've, we've got 92% of our population have got white faces, 75% of them are Anglo-Celts, 7% are Asian. Um, the, the, I think we are still growing up. We are xenophobic and that's played on with 
boat people and all the rest of it. We, we, we haven't matured as a country. I think you worked on the John Howard campaign where that slogan first appeared. Yes. Um, I mean, do you think that was a wrong thing to have done? Um, yes. Or you regret it? I wouldn't go that far, but I think it was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> John Howard never regretted anything, actually, <laughs> now that I think about it. Um, Jermaine. Today, um, I've done this to you before. I've talked to you about my taxi drivers. Yes, you have. Today, I was in a taxi being driven by a Sikh from the Punjab. And he started to tell me about his family. And he said, you'll be surprised to learn I am the fifth generation of my family to live in this country. And he pointed out that amongst the very first settlers in Australia were people from the Indian subcontinent. He was talking about the Pathans whom we call Afghans, the people who ran the camel trains that kept the inland alive. But apparently the early seamen in the very first fleet were from South India. So they were amongst the very first settlers in the first fleet. Now who thinks about the first fleet mm -hmm. as having people from the Indian subcontinent? We have been deluding ourselves about our Anglo-Celt um, <laughs> descent as if it was the pattern for the country because in fact it's always had other people but I think really that our, our terrible insecurity whenever we're faced with people from anywhere else who might have an interest in this continent is to do with the slenderness of our own claim to it. We know our presence is illegal. If we don't sort that out we can't sort anything else out. Let's, uh, let's hear from Craig. I mean, do you hear, hear echoes of uh, old debates, really, in the United States, another country built on immigration that was taken over by, or from Indigenous people, by settlers? Yeah, and, and I guess, you know, what I'm hearing a lot is just the, the fear. You know, what, what are we so uh, afraid of? I mean, I live in Los Angeles, and it's just, uh, I, mean, I mean, it's, uh, we're almost the, the minority there. Um, and... And I, I, I don't know what we're scared of or what, why we're so uh, fearful or um, it's, it's kind of mind blowing to me that, to, to think about that. Except I want to say something about that because American hunter-gatherer people, indigenous Americans, have had, for example, mineral rights since the beginning of the 20th century and we're still having trouble sorting it out. There has been acceptance of traditional lands and traditional methods of transmission of property and so on in the United States. We don't very often give the United States credit for this, but we didn't even learn from their experience or even understand how they did it. Even now, the Canadians have given a third of the country back to the Inuit and the Australians still haven't figured out why they did that and whether it gives them whether it gives the hunter-gatherer people of North America a better chance of survival. All hunter-gatherer peoples around the world are in the most terrible state of despair. They, are, they have only the option of assimilation. There really is no other option. But in America you have fascinating things like, you know, the movement to give um, Indian homelands a, an independent income by allowing them a gambling license, yeah. which wasn't allowed to people from other communities. There have been all kinds of inventive and intelligent ways of changing things. I taught school in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I lived in Osage County, and the Osage had had mineral rights for the petroleum out of Osage County, which is vast, for 80 years when I was there. And in Australia, we still haven't figured it out. OK, we're going to change... Uh Direction. If you'd like to continue the discussion, check out the Q&A Facebook page. Our next question tonight comes from Fran Hagen. Porn is part of sex education in schools. The Oxford definition is printed or visual material containing the explicit description or display of sexual organs or activity intended to stimulate sexual excitement. Do we really want to st stimulate sexual excitement in our school children? Ben Law. <laughs> Um, I've been writing about sex education for a little while now. I, uh, about four years ago, I think I went on the road with um, various types of sex educators around the country and looked at what they actually did in classrooms. Uh, a lot of it is outdated, anachronistic. A lot of it is conflicting. 
Um, you've got some educators telling children that taking the pill is tantamount to abortion. You've got some people telling children that homosexuality is exclusively caused by childhood sexual abuse. Um, you've got people telling people that condoms break all the time, like constantly, so don't even use them. Just save yourself for the holy act of marriage and you'll be fine. And then I saw a lot of kids sign virginity pledges, you know, and this is not, this is not a niche sort of fringe movement. This is in a lot of um, religious and state schools across the country. Now, where porn comes into it, I find it's interesting because when sex education is failing, and I think it actually is, uh, young people are going to look for sex education elsewhere and one of the key proxy sex, sex education tools that they use is, is pornography. Um, Just to come to the question, you're not actually suggesting that pornography should be used in schools, but that the idea of pornography should be discussed. Absolutely. I think pornography needs to be discussed and one of the reasons why is that the majority, well over 80%, of especially young males between the ages of 16 and 17 are already watching pornography on a regular basis, X-rated pornography. Um, they're going to the internet and they're finding out what sex looks like. And of course, this is problematic when you haven't had sex yet. This is your first image of a sexual encounter. And you think that when you finally do have a sexual encounter with a girl, that they totally want to be sprayed on. You know, and, and, <laughs> and so... <laughs> And some girls do, and that's okay, but a lot of them don't. They don't. And I think, I think girls have a reason to be upset when this happens. <laughs> Craig, uh, let's hear from you. I mean, you've obviously oh, yeah. devoted a good deal of your ministry to examining this. What about sex education in schools? Is there a place for the discussion, at least, of pornography? Yeah, and I think sex education, for the most part, in schools is irrelevant. Because by the time... It's so outdated, it's... Um, it's, it's, it's not even, it's so late in the game. Uh, the average age someone sees porn now is 11. And so by the time, I remember watching those videos in school and it's just like, this doesn't teach you anything um, about the reality of, of sex. So what, what you're saying is exactly true. Kids go to porn first because their parents don't talk about it. So I think we can blame the school system. First, for us, it's educating parents to say, look, you've got to have not just the conversation about sex, but you've got to have several. Um, and I, I think the biggest thing we've seen and the fear is porn has become sex ed, not what's taught in the classroom. And porn has taught you everything, I think, um, but what sex is about. Um, you know, anal. Anal sex, everyone thinks is, you know, that's what every girl likes. Well, let me just tell you, girls do that because it pays double in Los Angeles. When you make porn films, you make 1500 If you have vaginal sex, that's 750 So they don't tell you that in a video. And so we have kids walking around saying, you know what, I, I want to have anal sex. Uh, and, and oftentimes in the church, I'm hearing kids saying, I'm saving my virginity, so I'll have anal sex uh, instead of vaginal sex. <laughs> but, you know, there's, it's crazy because people... So, are so thinking, how do you, to come to the question, how do you deal with that in schools? How do you actually leap ahead of the game if you're starting too late, as it were, as you say? I, I don't know if... if if sure we got to we got to talk about something, but I think it starts in the home, and so I, I wouldn't play porn in in school. But why are we so blind to, to think that these kids haven't heard this or they haven't talked about this? Look what's on their iPhone. Look what's on their text messaging. I mean, they they're far more educated than we give them credit for, um, and I think we're worried about what do we say. I mean, I speak at churches all the time, and sometimes parents are so fearful. Well, should my twelve year old be in? in Sunday service when you're speaking. Absolutely, your 12 year old knows more than probably you do about this issue. And that's what's scary because it's misinformation that they do know. Krista Hughes. It was interesting something you just said then because I have had, I'm quite old fashioned when it comes to pornography. I'm a 70s kind of girl. And I've been wondering why so much porn and mainstream porn has been anal. And you just explained it then because they get paid twice as much. Mm. But I've been, uh, my whole campaign late, not my whole campaign, I'm hugely exaggerating, but I've been like, bring the pussy back to porn. Why <laughs> has the vagina become like a fifth grade citizen, <laughs> like a refugee in porn films? Like, it's this non existent thing, which I've found repulsive. Anyway, but yes, look, should porn be in sex education? I think the fact that kids are, porn is so accessible. I mean, all you have to do is go into a computer and go, are you over 18? Yes. And that's kind of as far you need to go, like, you can watch whatever you, whatever you want to watch, yeah. as hard 
as hardcore, or whatever you want to see, you can watch it. So yeah, I think if there is sex education, uh, they need to broach uh, pornography and what people are likely seeing. And the fact that a lot of uh, mainstream heterosexual porn involves a woman with a lot of plastic surgery and a bleached anus and 12 men is not your average sexual encounter. Yeah. But can I, Let's, can I or not something that? you yeah. should be aiming for. Yeah, and you know, I was at sex... Uh, well, unless you really want to, but no, if that's you, I don't know. <laughs> no, but it's, it's interesting because at Sexpo, we were at Sexpo here in Sydney for the last four days, I've never seen so much lube. And you know, if you're having, you know, for the most part, vaginal sex, you know, you, you probably don't, I mean, I've never had to buy lube, but everybody that's watching these videos going, you know, I'm just get this straight. You are a conservative of... Christian. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's... What are you doing in the sex boat exactly? Uh, we're we're handing out research. No, we're <laughs> we're letting people know that Jesus loves porn stars as much as he loves pastors. But but I think that the idea there is people are watching these videos. They assume that's the sex that they're going to have. So you go to Sexpo and you need to buy lube because to have the sex that they're having in these videos requires lots of lube. Do you have some sort of special techniques to not become stimulated yourself? I mean, uh, is this a problem for you? Well, no, but what he said it best. It's the most unsexy place that you've seen. And, and so, I mean, Sexpo. people... Yeah, Sexpo, because people, you know, ask me all the time, well, how do you do it? You're a pastor, you're married. I mean, you bring... I mean, surely you can't do that. But when What you did attract you to being a porn pastor? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm curious. I was a youth pastor before I was a porn pastor. So, um, the biggest thing I saw with kids in our youth group was... I had to work really hard to find porn growing up, and, and I wasn't tall enough to reach it on the magazine racks. Uh, and my kids in my youth group had to work really hard to avoid it. And so I just, we had this idea, let's create a safe place online so people could get help and the truth about porn. We never wanted to shut it down or legislate or do all the things that our parents tried to do that didn't work, but uh, just help people. And so we started TripleXSearch.com, and we've been to 70 of these sex bows around the world. Uh, with the children? Uh, no. The kids, <laughs> no. You've got to be 18 and over to go to the sex post. But, uh, but just letting people know, you know, hey, that, hey, proceed with caution. This stuff could be dangerous. This stuff could be addictive. Um, and just, you know, just have conversations with people. Toby Ralph. Uh, porn education in schools. I think nine out of ten kids are watching porn and the other one's lying. So... <laughs> So it's something that we what actually be, need. What, what do you think we need um, to deal with it? The schools should do to address that. Um, <laughs> they because should... uh, uh, we heard Ben saying that it should at least be discussed in schools. What's actually happening? Yeah, I, I think it should be discussed. I think it's a large part of people's lives at that age, and and we need to be very candid about it. I think we need to demystify it quite candidly. Jermaine. Well, you know what I think. Maybe this is the way forward. Because generally, when you put things in school, they become totally uninteresting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I mean... <laughs> if the teacher is standing up there telling you what the mature attitude towards this stuff is, you're going to think, this is the least cool thing in the world. <laughs> you know, geography, big bore, travel, fantastic. It might actually throw kids back on their own creativity. My, my problem is simply this, that most porn is really, really dreary, repetitive, ordinary. And I spent some time of my misspent youth trying to invent a new kind of erotic art that was open-ended, that people could get into. We wanted to have, so when we started the magazine called Suck, I wanted there to be things like a page made of latex. We had to think, how do I get into this page? <laughs> uh, and, but instead of having all the usual imagery, we would have more suggestive, difficult, where there would actually be a connection with art, it would be called erotic art and not pornography. Pornography is the advertisement of prostitution. That's the, the traditional meaning in Greek. Uh, if you're actually trying to awaken kids' imagination to the possibilities of interaction and erotic connection, of intimacy, one of the things you don't get in porn is conversation. Mm. The sexiest thing you can do is talk to somebody I, I and guess... not about their plumbing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've just, just got a person with their hand up up the back there. I'll just take that question there. Go ahead. Yes, that's you. Oh, good day. Um, 
I'm a little interested that everyone's surfing around the real, um, I suppose, the dark and dangerous corners of the internet that 12-year-old kids can wander into. And um, it's all kind of talking about almost the, the banal kind of stuff. I'm interested in the panel's response to where 12-year-olds could end up and some of the really nasty stuff that's out there. Yeah, good question. Ben? Um, look, I, I, I'm not a parent myself, so I don't really know how to address this issue. There are those tips about putting it in, uh, putting your computer in the shared area so your 12-year-old shouldn't be looking at it when you're around. Um, I don't want to completely demonise porn at the same time because in my mind, porn is maybe this is a bad analogy, but porn is like poetry, okay? Most of it's really awful, but it's also, uh, when you get a good one, it's responsible for some of the most breathtaking and awe-inspiring imagery known to man. <laughs> that said, that said, I do agree that modern day porn is missing a lot. I mean, I've said this before, but it's missing things like communication. It's missing smiles. It's, it's missing, missing silly moustaches. Yeah, totally. It's missing, it's actually... It's missing the pool cleaner and the tight shorts. Exactly. It's not just missing moustaches. It's missing all body, body hair. hair. It's missing body hair. Where are no, the pubes? Where's the, bush? <laughs> where's the bush? Where's the vagina? Where's everything? And, I'm uh, going to interrupt you because we've actually got a question again on this subject. It's from Saeed Fassai. With the spread of internet, porn is increasing becoming available across the world. And allegedly, it takes up about 70% of the traffic on the internet. With such a growth, what are we expected, what are we supposed to expect in the future? And what should the governments do to, to prevent and also to stop the growth of this addictive and perhaps destructive phenomenon? So we did get a microphone to you at the beginning. The beginning was the spread of the internet. Porn is increasingly becoming available worldwide with 70% of the traffic on the internet. And then you heard the rest of the question. Toby. Um, prohibition doesn't work. It's failed on just about everything else I can think of. I don't think we should go there. I actually have faith in society for solving its own problems. The, the ubiquity of porn for me, is actually a symptom of something rather larger. It's the, the sort of virtualization of intimacy, which we're seeing not only in sex, but also in, um, through social networking, where people are forming vast communities. They've, they've, so they're getting breadth of friendship without so much depth. I think, I think we're seeing just a very large change of which porn is one luminous part. Jermaine. I think this is a particularly... Um poignant problem when it comes to um, the Muslim world in particular, because uh, they can't keep out the marketing machine, because I think it basically is, it's, uh, you know, prostitution is the first service industry, and we sell everything in versions of prostitution. And so in our onslaught on the rest of the world, softening it up for marketing, uh, pornography is in the van. And where this really hurts me is that I watch women who are struggling for basic human rights in the Muslim world who are not helped at all by the fact that there's a solid wall of, pro of pornography coming down on them, which makes it very easy for their leaders to say, this is the grand shaitan, this is the devil corrupting the rest of the world. So that I, as a Western feminist, know that I have no locus standi. I watch women in Egypt being beaten up in the street, being forced to undergo uh, virginity examinations and so on, knowing that even if I make a statement of support, it actually puts those women in more jeopardy. And we are, this is serious. As an old Marxist, I think of it as an aspect of marketing, that what we're doing is softening up the rest of the world to be our clients in our neo-mercantilist progress. Um, and I, I, don't, I think it's got less to do with lust and, and libido than it has to do with sheer exploitation. But other people would take a different view. Um, Should it be regulated? I think the question... Oh, for is... God's sake. There's, a, there's no regulation. The minute you regulate... When we were asked the question about the internet, my first feeling was a completely different one. Because what I worry about is people grooming our children on the internet. 
and to, to take care of that situation, which is the really sinister one, the children have to know what it's like to be being groomed and what they're being groomed for. They have to know not to panic, but they have to know what to do. As it is, the groomers have a way of talking to them that they find compelling. They want to hear more of that talk because it's not talk they'll get from anywhere else. This is a much more complex problem mm -hmm. and it has to do with how we relate to other people. Are other people there for us to exploit and use any way we like? Or do we really need to read the Quran? It might help. We might actually begin to think about people as people and not as purveyors of some service for us. Let's go to Craig on this and... Uh, yeah. oh. The question really is, yeah. uh, is there a role for government to No, and it's too late for the government. Um, and, and to me, it's... Uh, when the internet first came out, had, there been, had it been tougher to find porn um, you know, back then? Now it's just click here, 18 and over. I mean, it's, it, there's an issue right now with it's too easy to find, but we're not going to solve that one. It's going to get easier and easier as technology advances and every you know, device that you have is hooked up to the internet. The problem is in the homes. It's not in the schools. It's not with governments. And I do have hope that that's going to change because my parents and our, that generation didn't talk to their kids about sex. Um, and they didn't, uh, you know, have pornography like we've had pornography. My dad thinks Playboy's porn when it's like, man, that's not even considered porn. <laughs> I do think what's going to happen is, you know, as, as I've had kids and my friends have had kids and we all understand the Internet. We all understand porn. We all understand all that. I think this conversation, if it's brought into our homes and communicated and filters and, and different things that we understand, this in our home, that we're going to communicate this. We're going to talk to our kids and not wait for the church or for the school to do it. I think that's how we solve it, in our homes. That's a good place to uh, leave that subject. It's time to move along to other things. You're watching Q&A. Our next question tonight comes from Deb Corbin. Okay. After the massacre in Afghanistan, U.S. Staff Sergeant Bates has been returned to America for trial. If a U.S. If a US soldier that was posted to Darwin... Um, was to murder an Australian civilian, civilian uh, wouldn't we expect that they'd be tried in Australia? Toby Ralph. Uh, yes, we would. The US, I believe, give a, an undertaking to their troops that they won't be tried overseas if they're found guilty of something there, not, uh, which wasn't designed for an incident like this. Um, th th it appears in this case that this guy's gone out, uh, gone nuts, killed... 16 people, including nine babies, and set them on fire afterwards. Um, it sounds reprehensible. It, it appears to be so. Um, but the US have guaranteed their troops that they're gonna, they'll always be tried at home if there's a legal problem. That's why this is happening, I think. Yeah, t tell us about this incident. Robert Fisk, the uh, rather famous um, and irascible uh, Middle East correspondent, has actually said um, the way that the Americans have treated this man and commentators are treating him as, as if it, they're apologising for, for him having a mental illness and a mental breakdown. Fisk says, you never get that kind of apology when it comes to the other side of the coin. If an Afghan did something similar, you wouldn't be hearing that he was mentally deranged, simply that he was a mad terrorist. Exactly right. And is that a problem? Uh, is that a problem of perception? Uh, there, yes, of course there's a problem there. And, and, and you know, there is a war and truth is a casualty um, and they need to carefully attempt to manipulate the position so they they can continue what they see as helping that country um, so there's a yes it, it's it's inaccurate and untrue Jermaine it's the most dreadful situation I mean this man had been made to do a fourth tour of duty he'd been already injured twice he'd lost part of a foot his wife was fed up with him having a fourth tour of duty. But more to the point, he is in a country where he is not wanted. Now, the same thing happened in Vietnam. You had all these bewildered Americans who were, were suddenly in somebody else's country, which they're meant to be saving from something, and the people hate them. The people are blowing them up. The people are, in the case of Vietnam, you know, we had... Uh, bombs hidden in the, uh, the huts that the guys were living in and so on. So he sees a man the day before get his leg blown off by an IED. Now, the improvised explosive devices are laid in the roads by the Taliban by night. You cannot tell me that the civilian population don't know that they're there. 
uh, they, we are not wanted in Afghanistan by anybody. I'm gonna, and um, now not even by Hamid Karzai. I'm Kazar. just going to interrupt you because we've got another question on this and we'll bring in the rest of the panel when we hear from our questioner. And the questioner is, uh, is Benjamin Daniels. Uh, hi, yeah, I'm uh, uh, an American uh, living in Australia. And I, and I guess around this, I saw on uh, the email Q&A sent out that uh, someone on the panel, I forget uh, who it was exactly, was advocating that Australia stay in Afghanistan for decades to come to do really good work. And um, I, I, since I've been in Australia, I've kind of struggled to understand why Australia is even in Afghanistan. And I, and I, don't, I don't know what... Uh, <laughs> I, I, America's a whole other story, but um, you know, this is the country now, I'm in now. But um, I, I just wonder what more time of Australians being in Afghanistan would do for Australia or Afghanistan, Afghanis, and um, it, it seems like it'd just be years more of in deaths and injuries and, and trauma. And okay, um, well, I'm going to go first of all back to Toby because that was a reference to you because I think you do believe if we're going to be there, we need to be there for decades. I think we do. I, um, I haven't been to, into Afghanistan since just before the last election. Um, and I spent some time there and I spent quite a lot of time talking to the villagers. I was very surprised and shocked to learn at that time, and it may have changed since, but at that time there was cautious support from most, most villagers for international intervention. These people are terrified of the Taliban in many cases, terrified of them. They, they restrict their rights, they treat their women like livestock and they want them out, but they don't have the guts to take them on. Eventually, when the villages turn against the Taliban, they'll be able to have some choice. They want choice, not necessarily Western-style democracy, but they want choice in their lives. If, and, and they're reluctant to team with international forces because Afghanistan, since the time of Alexander the Great, has had invaders flooding in yeah. and then being chased away. A, a Taliban put it to me very succinctly. He pointed at my wrist and he said, you have the watches, we have the time. <laughs> they, th so if we're gonna be in Afghanistan, if we're gonna help that beleaguered country, then let's stay there and do the job properly, not sort of bail out halfway through. That, that would mean an unlimited commitment though, wouldn't it? Just yes. based on the, uh, that analogy you just made. Yep, it does. Krista Hughes. I'm just anti-war. <laughs> History has proven again and again and again and again and again it is so destructive, so so futile and so horrendous. Uh, and it's, yeah, poor Afghanistan, yes, the Russians came in, so then the Americans armed the Taliban to fight the Russians, then the Americans came in to fight the lot that they'd armed earlier to fight them. Like, it's just a disaster. No one should be there. The Afghanis should be in Afghanistan. Well, you missed out on September 11, which was sort of in the middle there, and that's why the Americans went there to uh, take Afghanistan. Oh, yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah, even though there were no Afghanis on that plane. But, you know, it, it's... No, I don't think Australia should be there. It's a pity we, we went there. It's a pity American got... It, it's just horrendous. I just find war so repulsive. And the longer it drags out and the more confused it becomes and that the longer uh, America and Australia stays there, the more the, the, the extra tension and internal fractions seem to be carrying on. Which we started in the first place. Let's get Craig's perspective on this once again. And I don't get it either. I mean, I have no idea why why we continue to stay in all these places. You know, watching these the Republican debates right now uh, about what's going on in Israel and should we go? You know, where should we go next? I love. Um, and, and I'm not a huge supporter of, of Ron Paul, but he was the smartest one on the panel to go, hey guys, like we have no money. Like we're $13 trillion in, in, in debt. We can't fund this. We can't continue to pay for this. Not only talking about is it right or should we go, I think like we're broke and we're worried about all these other, and it's awful it sounds like what's happening over there, but why is it our job to fix that? And okay. so I, I say we stay out of We've it. We've got a few hands up over in the audience here. We'll get a microphone down there. In the meantime, Ben, what do you think? I think it's a little bit trickier than than that. I mean, look, I, I predominantly am anti-war as well. I, like the rest of Australia, oppose the Iraq war. I marched against it. I think with the Afghanistan war, when, we, when it came to 2000, um, September, September 11, uh, we were on the hunt for Osama bin Laden, who was being harboured by the Taliban in Afghanistan. We were looking for him. And I think, in principle, that was um, a just thing to do. But now... 
Over 10 years later, the situation has changed. Um, Osama bin Laden uh, has been found and killed in, in Pakistan, of all places. Now, we've actually become a part of a coalition that has changed the course of Afghanistan's history. And I think what we need to be wary of is our responsibilities in ensuring that there is a smooth transition to a stable government. I think the only problem with that assertion is, at what point do you actually say, yes, it's stable now, we can go? I think that's a very, very difficult thing to define. And we've got a couple of hands up here. We'll, just, we'll hear from both of these uh, two people. You first, sir. Aren't the Taliban simply very conservative Afghanis? And if we are optimistic about the Afghanis running their own country, wouldn't the majority outvote them? And we'll get around to hear from this lady on the edge there. I think we'll hang on. We've got the microphone to you. There we go. <laughs> Um, my question is what particularly puts us as members of Western nations in a position of superiority where we can assume what is and right and wrong for these people in other countries? We may be better resourced, but we're not, certainly not the best resourced. And we're not without our own political problems. So who are we to say what's right and wrong in the first place? Let's go to Toby. Um, to, what, sorry, what was the first question again, briefly? The, uh, Will the Taliban be outvoted, essentially? Uh, you don't outvote people who cut people's heads off. Um, that's the problem with the Taliban. Um, democracies are not free. They've just had a, an election there. The, uh, democracies are not free and fair there. It's not representative voting. It's rigged. And the Taliban run the regions anyway. It's, it's 34 regions. The, the uh, Karzai is called the mayor of Kabul because he has so little influence outside it. So. No, it's not as simple as a free and fair election. In terms of interventionism, it's failed massively on many occasions. We don't have a right, but maybe we have some responsibilities. I mean, it's failed in, oh, you name it, Vietnam, Korea, Iraq, Palestine. It's had some successes in places like Haiti and Kampuchea, but invariably interventions, particularly imperialist ones without a withdrawal plan and a lot of sort of just cause rationale, don't work and end up hurting the country, you're right. Jermaine, briefly to you, because we are running out of time. Look, in the 21st century, war is too destructive to use. It, it can only create further chaos. It can only introduce a whole new set of crises into an already critical situation. There is no way that anyone will accept an occupying army, no matter what story they tell about themselves. Even people who would have been pro-Western in Afghanistan are not pro-Western anymore because of what it's like to live with an army. Um, Australia's got... What about East Timor, by the way? Well, what about East Timor? Well, we sent our army in there to keep the peace, to uh, and protect we did, we people. There is this idea in the United Nations now called the responsibility to protect. It's yeah. what happens when <laughs> dictators start killing their civilians. Well, it's also what happens when Al Jazeera tells us lies about what dictators are doing to control their civilians. The whole Libyan disaster, I mean, we, we still haven't figured out what we've done there, except probably split Libya in half. Uh, and that was on pretty bad information. Likewise, Iraq, bad information. What was really going on? I mean, Australia has a delusion that it should be on the Security Council, that it's actually one of the ruling nations of this beleaguered planet. I, we have to snap out of all of that and we have to be, get smart. We have to do the thing you do at the end, you know. We can't do the war, war, war. We're going to have to go straight to the jaw, jaw, jaw. We're going to have to start talking, but we can't talk to these people until we at least learn their language. Okay. As I said, we're coming to the end of uh, tonight's Q&A. We have received a uh, web question from Irena Lucas in Grass Tree Hill, Tasmania. Tony Abbott and his condolence message named Margaret Whitlam as Goff's consort. On such a sad day for the Whitlam family, he went on to rubbish the Whitlam government in the next breath, using it as a political opportunity. I'd like to know what the panel <laughs> thinks about this. Uh, ben Law. Oh, Tony Abbott can't seem to help himself, can he? I mean, he's like someone who can't get his hand off something else <laughs> attached to him. And I don't know, like... <laughs> <laughs> reading, reading... Um, look, Margaret Whitlam was a bit before my time. You know, I was born in 1982. But it's been such a joy actually reading the tributes to this woman and learning about her. And to have Tony Abbott, you know, describe her as, as a consort and also add, oh, yeah, and P.S., I didn't like Goff, 
We know you don't like golf. <laughs> you don't need to say it. Toby, was that uh, poor judgment on Tony Abbott's part? It was. He overstepped the market. He shouldn't have said it. That's it? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Jermaine. What a surprise. What a surprise that Tony Abbott embarrasses us. I'm, I'm dreading if it's true that the, he's going it to be... It was a sort of throwaway line. I mean, apart from anything else... Throwaway he... line? He was actually supposed to be making a statement about the death of someone we all know and love very much. I will miss Margaret. I loved her. Mr Hughes. I agree. I agree. I think everyone <laughs> in this room agrees. I just roll my eyes. Tony. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you mean the other Tony. <laughs> yeah. okay. Tony. <laughs> Greg, it's not fair to bring you in on this, but no. Uh, no, I'll, I'll... we thank you very much for being on the panel. We're going to have to wrap it up. That's all we have time for. Please thank our panel, Toby Ralph, Jermaine Greer, Christy Hughes, Craig Gross, Benjamin Law. <laughs> Christy, that's your cue. Ah. <laughs> right. Next week. Next week we meet on Q&A. The Queensland election will be on our minds with Trade Minister Craig Emerson, Shadow Attorney General George Brandis, Queensland Green Senator Larissa Waters, political strategist Graham Morris and Labor lawyer Liberty Sanger. We'll leave you tonight with Krista Hughes performing Cheap Thrills, which I guess is a bit of an antidote to um, some of the alcohol advertisements we've been getting recently. Good night. Flat beer, watered down gin, wet dreams, wiped out men. Few wretched wishes washed down with every swill. You know it sounds like Sounds like you've been drinking like a fish Flapping at the gills Talk, tales, bullshit brags Powders and pills, oh baby, take the whole damn lot <laughs> Till you cease to feel Oh, there's nothing like Oh, there's nothing like So I went and shuffled with drop kicks in the night the sanctions with poor wells And I chit chat with shunks And believe me, I talk shit with show-offs I'm talking desperation poised Till it reached overkill Oh, there's nothing like Oh, there's nothing like The cheap thrills Oh, there's nothing like Bottom. Now at this point, I could go back home All alone and broke Or sit here accepting your drinks And laughing at your lousy jokes Yeah, I'll sit here looking pretty And keep my big mouth shut I'll wake up tomorrow morning Beside you have double vision And feel like, oh honey Deep cracks need more than such shallow well, it's a mighty high price to pay for such It's a mighty high price to pay for such Cheap thrills oh. The cheap thrills for such cheap thrills for such cheap thrills. Thank you. The honky tonk chunks. Ha, ha, ha.